Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Ollie Burton. I'm a clinical research fellow currently working in neurosurgery in the UK NHS. And in this video, I'm gonna be answering some of your questions about how specialty training or residency, as some other countries might call it, how that process works in the NHS in England and the UK more widely. There are loads of people who do their specialty training in the UK, lots of people from other countries who want to come and do their specialty training residency in the UK and want to know more about how the process works. The only thing to say is I got an unbelievable number of responses when I put this question out on my Instagram profile some time ago, more than a hundred questions. So I'm going to split this into two videos because otherwise the videos are just going to be way too long. But in any case, if your question is not answered in the video, it might be answered in the other one. Or if I don't answer it properly or don't give as much information as you would like, then please do let me know down in the comments and I'll do my best to give you more detail. This first one comes from glory.s, tips for fourth year medical student. I have no idea what I want to do. This is a really, really common question and don't worry, it's not a problem at all. So for those who don't know, fourth year medical student is someone who's definitely into their clinical phase coming towards the end of their medical schooling and almost at the point of being a newly qualified doctor. I think it's fine to not know what you want to do. It doesn't really matter, but obviously the time will come when you're wanting to dedicate yourself to a particular path pathway and wanting some direction in your life. And I think there are two ways to approach this or the two ways that worked for me. Either you will find things that you are interested in, so things that appeal to you. So for example, for me, I enjoy working with my hands, what we call tactility. I enjoy doing procedures and interventions, which means that surgical specialties would be a good fit for me, potentially something like cardiology, ITU, putting in lots of lines and things, or radiology, particularly interventional radiology. And what organ systems do you like? I like the brain, the spinal cord, which again, lets me think about neurology, neurosurgery, neuroradiology even just to start with. So perhaps what organ systems, what body systems do you like? And then what do you actually want to be doing? You know, do you want something really high energy, frenetic, lots of variety, in which case something like A&E, acute medicine might be a good fit? Or do you want to do something much more specialist within a narrower domain, but do it very, very well. So do you want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon, for example, just doing valve surgery, or do you want to be a liver surgeon, just doing transplants over and over again? You can also think about how narrow and broad your focus might be. But then the other practical thing I think that works is deciding what you don't want to do and eliminating things from there. So I hate ward rounds, for example, particularly very long ones, which means that most medical specialties are not gonna work for me. And I like something with a bit of pace. So psychiatry, for example, which relies on lots of very long, nuanced interactions with patients where you need to spend a lot of time with them to do the job properly, that's not such a good fit for my personality. I'm a bit more impatient. I want to get on, do things, make interventions and move on. So I think a combination of deciding what works for you, so what domains and what you actually want to be doing, and then what doesn't work for you, and that will allow you to both steer yourself in a particular direction and away from other things. I think that will help you decide where you want to end up. Jeffrey Gold asks, can you apply to more than one program? Yes, you can, absolutely. And it is actually, I think, more common now to apply for multiple programs than to not. All specialty training applications in the UK use the same application portal. That's something called Oriel, which is an admissions portal, a bit like UCAS, if you remember applying for university through this one centralized system. It's like that, but for specialty training. And through the Oriel portal, you can select from as many different specialties or as few as you would like. So it would be just as possible in one application cycle to apply, say, only for core surgical training or just for general practice, if those are the only things you want to do. But you could just as easily throw applications in for psychiatry, GP, radiology, neurosurgery, pediatrics, emergency medicine, and so on and so forth. The only limiter on how many specialties you apply for in a single cycle will be how many times you have the patients to go through their various application forms, and of course, how good a candidate you are. Everything's becoming more competitive. There's not an awful lot of sense in applying for a specialty where you don't fit the person's specification very well, and you're gonna be rejected quickly. It's probably a waste of your time. I would much more recommend 
tailoring your application and portfolio towards specialties in which you are likely to be successful. Mary Myri Patterson asks, do things like quips or essay prizes need to be specific to the specialty for points? Now, this is a good question and it applies very generally to the portfolio when you're applying for specialty training or residency training. The scoring in terms of how shortlisting is done is specific by specialty. Okay, so although your portfolio will obviously be consistent because you only have one and you can apply for multiple different specialties, so I could apply for neurosurgery, radiology and GP, for example. Each of those specialties has their own ideas about what they think is important and they will score my portfolio in different ways. So one specialty might like you to have a lot of papers written, one specialty might like you to have done a lot of audit and one specialty might like you to have done a lot of teaching, for example, or passed lots of exams. The short answer is, is that different specialties differ in what they will award you points for and those things can change year to year and they often do. The process is revised every single year. Up until fairly recently, it didn't tend to matter what domain your work had been done in. So if you had won a prize in surgery, say, it would usually count regardless of the specialty. It would just count as a national prize. If you had attended a conference, it wouldn't matter. If you had published a paper in a PubMed index journal, that used to be good enough for all specialties. But because everything has gotten so competitive and the bottlenecks are so tight on training posts, increasingly now it does have to be related to the specialty. So for surgery, for example, the portfolio tends to say this work, you know, this prize, this audit, this paper must be in a journal relevant to surgery. This prize must be relevant to surgery or radiology. Everything has been dialed up to 100 on being radiology specific. Like you must have done a paper that is relevant to radiology, an audit that is relevant to radiology. You must have held a national leadership position that is relevant to radiology. I really don't know how more than like five people are gonna be able to do that, but this is just the way that the scoring has gone. So historically, it didn't tend to matter now, I think the best advice is to assume that it matters, but always check by looking at the person's specification for the specialty. Ramiz Khan wants to know, not a doc, but always wanted to know what happens if you don't get matched to your chosen specialty. Yeah, so this idea of the match, um, this describes the process that happens in the US. We, we don't call it that in the UK, but I understand the point of what you're getting at, which is if you apply for a specialty post in XYZ and you don't get it, then what happens? So. Let's use myself as an example. I want to apply for neurosurgery training, right? There are, in a good year, 15 or so training places for the whole country, the UK, in neurosurgery. So only 15 people can get those posts, and there are 10 times that, more than 10 times that, who don't get a job. So what should someone do? Either you have also applied for another specialty, and you might get accepted into that, in which case you have to decide am I gonna start training in something else? Or am I gonna wait a year and apply again for the specialty that I do want? Or practically what people do is often say, right, I didn't get it this time, I'm gonna take a year out and apply again, because you can usually only apply once per year. This does depend on the specialty, but once per year is most common. What you would then have to do is find another job on a 12 month or six month contract, depending on what you want. That might be just working as what I am, like a locally employed doctor, a trust grade SHO for a period of time in a specialty to get more experience. You might work as a teaching fellow. You could leave medicine for a bit and do something else. You could be a locum doctor for that time and only work as much as you need to or want to work. That lifestyle is becoming increasingly untenable now as the locum market is basically collapsing. It's no longer a reliable source of income. But basically the short answer is find alternative employment until the application window comes around again the following November. Jacob Eaton Brown wants to know when applying to specialty programs, can you apply to complete them part time? Uh, the example that they give there is CST, core surgical training. The short answer is that in theory, yes, any specialty training program can be done part-time. So the standard working week for a doctor in training is 48 hours a week, minimum. Um, what that means is your rota has to average to 48 hours a week, but anything up to 72 hours is 
workable. You can apply to work less than full-time LTFT in any specialty. Most commonly that will be 80%, so working 80% of those full-time hours, usually over four days a week, or even 60%, three days a week with on calls and annual leave and everything done pro rata and your pay, obviously you'll be earning less if you do that. But the other key thing to understand is that if you decrease your training by 20%, so you're working 80% less than full time instead of 100%, it will increase the length of your training by the same amount of time to compensate. So just as a simple calculation, if your training program was four years long and then you moved to 80%, it would then take you five years to complete training. If you had an eight year training program that you wanted to complete 50%, working less than full time 50%, then it would extend your training to 16 years which is obviously a bit ridiculous. And more or less, any less than full-time working agreement will need sign-off by the relevant training program director in your local unit. In theory, you're supposed to be able to get 80% less than full-time for any reason whatsoever, but in some specialties, this will be much easier said than done. In some specialties, it's very, very common. So GP, lots of trainees are less than full-time. Pediatrics, I think it's more common than not to be less than full-time. But in surgical specialties, for example, much fewer people work less than full time. In neurosurgery, I've never met anyone working less than full time. I'm sure there are some, but not very many. So in theory, absolutely yes. In practice, it may need a bit of negotiation and challenge on your part. Charlotte DFA wants to know, what's the difference between applying for ST1 and ST3? Now, this is an important question for understanding how training in the UK actually works, because Broadly, there are two types of training, right? There's what's called uncoupled training and coupled or run-through, as it would be called. Now, if you have run-through training, let's start with that because it's the easiest to explain. That means that you finish your foundation program years, what we might call the internship years, if you were thinking about other countries, you would go into your specialty training after this and complete your training program from start to finish, applying once at the beginning, and then it might take you six years, seven years, eight years, and then you come out of the other end as a consultant and attending, whatever you like. This is what's called run-through training. It's actually quite uncommon in the UK and only a small handful of specialties offer it. Examples include GP, where it's actually only a three-year training program, Neurosurgery is one where it's eight years, paediatrics and ophthalmology, just to give some examples of run-through specialties, but they are few and far between, tend to be more competitive. By far, the most common training pathway will be what's called uncoupled training, where you finish your F1, F2 years, and then you apply for the first stage of your specialty training, which we will call the core stage or the SHO stage for, for ease of use. And what will happen here is that either you go into a core medical or core surgical generalized training pathway, working as a medical or a surgical SHO, where you are not yet dedicated to a specialty. And you will do this core level for a few years, building generalist skills in medicine or surgery, and then applying again at ST3, in the case of surgery, for your higher dedicated specialty training in, say, general surgery, vascular surgery, orthopedic surgery, whatever. Or in medicine, that comes at ST4. So in the fourth year, you will go then into your neurology or cardiology or respiratory medicine or whatever you want to do. To make things even more complicated, some specialties have this built in. So anaesthetics, for example, is a specialty where you will apply for core level anaesthetics, CT1, after your internship foundation years and do that for a few years. And then when you get to ST4, you will have to apply again for a registrar post, a senior training post to get you through to consultancy. So you can do the core bit and get in successfully passing some exams as you go. But if you don't successfully get into the higher bit, you cannot progress until you are able to secure a training post. So when you see these ST1, ST2, ST3, ST4, they basically describe the level of training at which you are applying. ST1, CT1 being the first year of training, and then higher numbers being further years down the line. ST8 usually being the terminal year. Maria Andreas 25 wants to know how much evidence is needed for the portfolio. 
Now, this is an interesting question and a good one. Most specialties will use what's called a self-scoring of portfolio matrix, whereby they will give you a series of points, right? And these points will be awarded for various things. That might be for teaching, for passing exams, for quality improvement projects, for publications, whatever. They give you lots of different domains which a candidate can score points in. And as part of the application process, you need to show, well, actually I've published you know, three first author papers in these surgical journals. I've got this teaching experience. I might have passed my MRCS. I've got a teaching qualification, whatever, whatever. Basically, the short answer is that anything you declare on your portfolio when you apply that you are rewarded points for when the shortlisting process happens, you need to be able to evidence. So say you've published some papers, you should be able to show a PubMed ID or a DOI link or something showing that you are whatever position author on that paper you said you are and it's published in the journal you say it is. If you have got a qualification, you need to be able to show them the certificate showing that you've got that qualification if you have led and designed a teaching program or something or done a quality improvement project, you need a signed letter from a supervising senior doctor saying that you have done XYZ and contributed XYZ to this project. Basically, you need to be able to evidence every single thing that you have put in your portfolio or that you say you have. I don't know that it's the case in all specialties that these things will actually be checked. In some, historically, the portfolio was checked at interview and people would bring a physical portfolio with them. When things are done online now, I'm sure that doesn't always happen. But the point is, is that from a regulator perspective, if you say you have done something when you haven't, or you can't provide the evidence of having done that, then it could be seen as a probity issue. And if an examiner or a marker looks at it the wrong way, then it would be grounds to refer you on a probity basis. So basically, don't lie about anything that you haven't done. And then lastly for this video, if you do things after the application deadline, but before the interview, does it still count? And lastly, Rohan wants to know, if you do things after the application deadline, but before the interview, does it still count? The rule of thumb that I believe is in use for most specialties is everything that you reference as being done on your application should be done by the application deadline. So if the application deadline is, say, the 16th of November in that year, everything that you submit and you want to score points for should be done by the 16th of November if you're expecting to score points. I'm sure that different specialties will give slightly different advice on where that cutoff actually is. And when you get to interview, it may be the case that you can discuss things that have happened after the application deadline because it might be relevant to an answer and it's not your fault that chronologically things have happened after the arbitrary application deadline but certainly if you are expecting to score points based on a portfolio that portfolio should be complete at the time of submission if i for example was scoring a portfolio and someone said well I've actually only got a place on basic surgical skills or ATLS or something two weeks after the application deadline, but I'm going to go and do it because your certificate for having done that course wasn't submitted at the time of submission, then I wouldn't be giving anyone the points. So that wraps it for this video, guys. Thanks for watching. There is a second part to this coming, but I'm gonna do it as a second video probably in a couple of days. So take care, watch out for the next one. I'll see you soon. And if you want me to expand on anything or try and answer anything in this particular video, let me know and I'll look down in the comments. Take care, bye-bye.